Um, our next speaker is one that I'm extremely excited about. It's quite timely too, because this year I've like read and watched a lot of content about veganism and getting myself more educated. And one of my favorite books this year was Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs and Wear Cows by Dr. Melanie Joy. And I'm not only saying this because she's on the call, but I absolutely fell in love with her book. And I actually shared it with my followers on Instagram as well. And I had a few people um, direct message me saying how much it opened their eyes to, you know, the world of cruelty in, with animals. But, um, and especially when Melanie posts or commented on my post, I had an intense fangirl <laughs> moment. So, which is why I'm so excited to be introducing the Harvard educated psychologist celebrated speaker and empowering author Dr. Melanie. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction by the way that was really uh, really nice to hear. So um, yeah this is exciting. I, um, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to or I'm grateful for the opportunity to have this conversation with a group of people who I know embrace the same values that I'll be discussing. Um, and also who are in positions of, of influence to actually help bring these values out into the world more fully. So I just want to begin with a big thank you for um, everybody who's here, everybody who is, ends up watching this, even who is not watching live, um, for who you are and, and what you do to bring more compassion and consciousness to a world very much in need. So I will be... Um, uh, as you know, I'm a psychologist, or as um, I think I was introduced as a psychologist, if I remember correctly. Um, my work spans a variety of topics, but all of my work actually falls under what could be called the psychology of compassion. Um, and the questions I've spent years exploring are basically what causes people, even those who are fully committed to compassion, to act in ways that are uncompassionate. Um, you know, causing harm to others and themselves, um, you know, and that causes them to connect, disconnect from rather than feel more connected with others. So really it's this, this question um, that I'm going to be exploring today. And more importantly, how can we use this understanding so that we can end up being more integrated in our values and behaviors, experiencing more personal peace and also helping to create a more compassionate world. Now, my work um, actually spans um, as well compassion toward humans and also compassion toward non-humans. And today I'll be focusing on um, compassion toward non-human beings. What gets in the way of this compassion? And since the um, work that I'm talking about and the topic that I'm talking about today really emerged from my own life experience, I actually want to start by talking a little bit about how I came to be here today. This is a picture of me a very long time ago now and my dog Fritz. Um, uh, Fritz was my first dog and in many ways he was my first friend. We did everything together. We played together, we napped together, and we even vomited together once during a, a sickening summer road trip. Um, and Fritz was also my first heartbreak when he died at the age of 13 of liver cancer. What I didn't realize back then was that my relationship with Fritz would be the catalyst for what became my life's work, which is to raise awareness of the psychology that causes us to act against our more compassionate nature. And today specifically, I'll be talking about the psychology that causes us to act against our compassion when it comes to how we relate to or interact with certain species of animals. And this psychology ultimately causes us to unknowingly harm not only other animals, but also the planet and even on ourselves and even ourselves. So, so really the goal of this talk is, is awareness raising. When we become aware of this psychology, we become empowered to make our lifestyle choices, to make our consumer choices, consumption choices freely. Because without awareness, there really is no free choice. Now, to help you understand the psychology that I'm talking about, I'd like you to imagine that you're sitting down to this lasagna and consider whether you would find this delicious or disgusting. Now, I know a lot of people who are, are watching this, um, you know, are probably 
thinking to themselves, oh, that's kind of disgusting. Um, but my guess is that there are also a number of people who are thinking, well, that looks kind of delicious. So for those of you who would find this dish delicious, let's imagine you find it so delicious that you ask your host for the recipe. And she replies that the secret is in the meat. You need to use three pounds of well-seasoned golden retriever. Now just take a moment to reflect on your thoughts and feelings. Chances are what you just thought of as food, you now think of as a dead animal. What you just felt was delicious, you now feel is disgusting. Chances are your experience of the meat dramatically changed, even though nothing about the meat itself actually changed. And if you were also told that the cheese was not from a cow, but actually came from, say, pig's milk, you probably would have even a stronger reaction. So really what changed is not the meat, it's not the cheese. What changed is simply your perception of the meat, your perception of the cheese. And when it comes to eating animals, and this includes um, the products procured from animals' bodies, such as eggs and dairy, um, our perception is in fact shaped largely, if not entirely, by our culture. In meat-eating cultures around the world, out of millions of possible species, people tend to classify only a tiny handful of animals as edible. All the rest we learn to classify as inedible and disgusting, and often even morally offensive. So even though the type of species consumed changes from culture to culture, members of all cultures tend to find their own choices to be rational, and the choices of other cultures to be irrational and disgusting and even sometimes offensive. So what's striking is not the presence of disgust, but rather the absence of disgust. Why are we not disgusted by the select species we've learned to think of as edible? And perhaps even more importantly, why don't we ever ask why? Have you ever wondered why you might eat chicken's wings, but not swan's wings? Fish soup, but not lizard soup? Have you ever wondered why you might eat hen's eggs, but not pigeon's eggs? Have you ever wondered why you might drink cow's milk, but not pig's milk? And have you ever wondered why you haven't wondered? For much of my life, I never wondered about these things. I grew up like many people with a dog who I loved and like most people, I grew up um, eating animals, um, even though I cared about animals. I would never want to cause them to suffer, especially when that suffering was so intensive and so completely unnecessary. And over the course of so many years and so many meals, I never thought about how strange it was that I could pet my dog with one hand while I ate a pork chop with the other. A pork chop that had once been an animal who was at least as intelligent and sentient as my dog. I just didn't make the connection between the meat on my plate and the living being it once was. It wasn't until 1989, when I was 23 years old, um, that I did make that connection. What happened was I ate a hamburger that turned out to have been contaminated with a, a very dangerous bacteria. And I wound up in the hospital on intravenous antibiotics, extremely ill. And after that, I just could not eat meat again. And um, I was just like, I became, essentially I became a vegan sort of by accident. And I ended up wanting to learn about my new diet, um, which of course led me to information about animal agriculture. And what I learned shocked and horrified me. I could not believe the extent of the suffering. I could not believe what was happening to the planet. And I was really just shocked and horrified. But what shocked me in some ways even more was that nobody I talked to wanted to hear what I had to say. The response was always something like, don't tell me that you'll ruin my meal or they call me a crazy vegan hippie propagandist. So I became very curious as to how rational and, and compassionate people, this is my friends and my family, and just like I had been, 
could just shut down their hearts and minds when it came to eating animals. And this was what led me to conduct years of research on the psychology, essentially, of violence and nonviolence broadly. Um, and then more specifically on the psychology of eating animals, which is what I wrote my doctoral dissertation on. And this is what I discovered. As it turns out, there's an invisible belief system or ideology that conditions us to eat certain animals. And I named this ideology or this belief system carnism. And we often assume that only vegans and vegetarians follow a belief system when it comes to eating animals. But when eating animals is not a necessity, which is true for many people in the world today, then it's a choice. And choices always stem from beliefs. Now, carnism is a special kind of belief system or ideology. It's a dominant ide ideology. That means it's invisible. It's woven through the very structure of society to shape norms, laws, beliefs, behaviors, etc. And it's a violent ideology. And I'm going to give you a heads up. I have a couple of slides, just a small handful of slides here that are um, a little distressing to witness, but I've been careful not to pick slides that have, you know, really traumatizing uh, imagery in them. So, and this is one of them. So carnism is a violent ideology. Meat cannot be procured without violence and egg and dairy production cause extensive harm to animals. In fact, the egg and dairy industries are in some ways the most brutal of all carnistic industries. But carnism, like other violent ideologies or oppressive systems is another way to describe these, runs counter to core human values. Values such as compassion, as I said earlier, and, and justice. And so they need to use a set of psychological defense mechanisms that distort our thoughts and numb our feelings so that we act against our values without realizing what we're doing. In other words, carnism teaches us how not to think and feel. It disconnects us from our natural empathy. Now, the main defense of carnism is denial, which is expressed largely through invisibility. The ideology itself is invisible. It's unnamed. Therefore, we don't see it. We can't question it. And of course, its victims are kept out of sight and therefore conveniently out of public consciousness. For example, 1.2 billion farmed animals, and this is only land animals, not even including fish and other aquatic life in this, are slaughtered, I'm actually gonna have you guess this, just wherever you are in the world, I'd like you to think about which of these answers you think is accurate every year, every six months, every month, or every week. If you guessed every week, you guessed correctly. So basically, in just one week, more farmed animals are killed than the total number of people killed in all wars throughout human history. But think of it. How many farmed animals have you seen? So this brings the question up, where are they? Well, about 96% of the meat, eggs, and dairy we eat actually comes from animals who were raised in factory farms, windowless sheds and remote locations um, you know, that are virtually impossible to obtain access to. And the remaining, you know, small percentage, depending on where you are in the world, you know, between two and, and four or five percent um, that are raised in so-called humane or organic farms or places, I should say, really don't fare much better. Um, despite the fact that these and, uh, animals are, are essentially treated as commodities, they are in fact sentient, intelligent individuals. For example, we know that pigs tend to be more intelligent than dogs. They're considered to be as intelligent as three-year-old humans. Um, 
chickens actually have exhibited altruistic behaviors and are in fact so much more intelligent than, than once thought. Scientists are, um, some scientists have, have advocated getting rid of the, the phrase, not using the phrase bird brain. Chickens can, can learn names, they can become pets, they can bond with humans. Um, cows form deep, or bovines form deep and lasting bonds with others in their herd. They tend to form friendships for life. And even fish and some other crustaceans have been shown to be significantly more intelligent than previously believed. Um, and also to have pain receptors such that um, harming them uh, is illegal in some ways and in some places in the world. But, um, it's McDonald's, what am I saying? Um, Whole Foods, for example, um, no longer uh, sells and hasn't for almost a decade now um, live soft shell crabs or lobsters on the grounds that boiling them alive is inhumane. And yet these animals, as I said, are, are perceived of often and treated as commodities. So just to give you an idea, I'm going to show you just four slides. They're not terribly bloody slides, but I do feel like it's important to point out some of the practices for people who are not familiar with um, animal agribusiness. Egg production, including so-called humane egg production, causes massive, massive uh, amounts of suffering. About six billion chicks are actually killed each year globally. Um, these are the unwanted byproducts, actually, of the egg industry. And the way that they're killed is they are typically um, either masturbated, which is ground alive, or dumped into plastic bags and left to suffocate. And the female chicks who are not killed um, have their beaks still, even in organic, so-called organic farms, have their beaks cut off um, without any painkiller. And more than 450 million chickens are killed for eggs in the US each year. Pork production also causes massive amounts of suffering to animals, of course. Um, pigs, female pigs, are kept in gestation crates where they birth, you know, a, will birth a litter of kid, uh, pigs, kids, a litter of pigs um, who are removed immediately after weaning and have to wean through these metal bars. Many of them um, die before ever making it to the slaughterhouse. Fish, most fish today are aqua farmed. Um, that means basically aqua farms are like factory farms for fish. Um, and the way that fish are killed is um, typically being left to suffocate to death. Sometimes they're electrocuted. And dairy production, which we tend to think of as the least problematic form of carnistic production, also causes extensive harm to animals. This is why one of the reasons why vegetarianism, which in, um, you know, many people believe is less harmful than uh, other forms of carnistic production, is in fact one of the most brutal, brutal practices of carnistic industry. This is an image from an organic dairy production facility. These um, cows are forcibly impregnated um, routinely in order to ensure that they continue lactating and their calves are removed for them, from them you know, almost immediately after birth. And chicken production, and this again, this is not an image of a so-called humane facility, but this is a, um, these are so-called broiler chickens. Um, these animals have no laws whatsoever protecting them, even though the law affords farmed animals very, very little protection. Um, chickens are, birds are actually exempt from that law. Many animals, as I've said before, um, end up going to the slaughterhouse while still conscious. Thank you for bearing witness to that. I know it's, it's actually the most difficult part of, of this presentation, but I think it's important to raise awareness of at least the basic you know, practices of carnistic industry. And our environment is also an invisible victim of carnism. According to the United Nations, animal agriculture is one of the most significant contributors to some of the most serious problems facing the world today. And of course, we are the invisible victims of carnism. We pay for our carnism with our health as eating carnistic products has been linked with some of the most prevalent diseases in the developed world today. 
everything from heart disease to cancer, obesity, and diabetes. And of course, we pay for our carnism with our hearts and with our minds. But denial, which is the primary defense of the system, can only protect us so much. You know, hints of the truth surround us. So carnism needs to also use the defense of justification. We need to learn to justify eating animals. And the way that we learn to justify eating animals is by learning to believe that the myths of meat, eggs, and dairy are the facts of meat, eggs, and dairy. We learn to believe in what I refer to as the three ends of justification. Eating animals is normal, natural, and necessary. And of course, these same arguments have been used to justify violent practices throughout history. Male dominance, for example, seen as normal, natural, and necessary. Heterosexual supremacy, and so on. A very common carnistic myth is the protein myth. We learn that we have to eat animals muscles in order to build protein or to get protein and build our own muscles. But of course, um, you can actually be strong enough to lift a car, even if you'd never eaten an ounce of animal protein in your life. I'm serious. Some of the strongest species on the planet are herbivores. An increasingly common myth is the uh, humane myth, this idea that um, it's possible to eat so-called happy to be eaten animals. Um, but this myth is really hard to recognize as long as we're operating from within the carnistic box. So to help you get out of the carnistic box, I'd like you to substitute a different species for those, tip, those species we learned to classify as edible. Most of us would consider it cruel to slaughter a happy, healthy golden retriever just because people like the way her thighs taste. And yet when the exact same thing is done to individuals of other species, we are expected to consider it humane. Now, carnism is, as a dominant system, this means carnism is institutionalized. All of these myths, these defenses are institutionalized. They're supported by all major social institutions. So when we study nutrition, for example, we actually study carnistic nutrition. And when we're born into an institutionalized system such as carnism, we inevitably internalize it. In other words, we learn to look at the world through the lens of carnism. And carnism uses a set of defenses that distort our perceptions of meat, eggs, dairy, and the animals we eat so we can feel comfortable enough to consume them. For example, we learn to see farmed animals as abstractions, as lacking any individuality or any personality of their own. So we learn to believe, for instance, that a pig is a pig and all pigs are the same. And when we look at the, lens, the world through the lens of carnism, we fail to see the absurdities of the system. Voltaire was right. If we believe absurdities, we shall commit atrocities. And carnism is but one of the many atrocities, one of the many violent ideologies that are an unfortunate part of the human legacy. And although the experience of each set of victims will always be somewhat unique, the ideologies themselves are structurally similar because the mentality that enables the violence is the same. It's the mentality of domination and subjugation, of privilege and oppression, it's the mentality that causes us to turn someone into something, to reduce a life to a unit of production. It's the might makes right mentality that makes us feel entitled to wield complete control over the lives and deaths of those with less power, just because we can, and to feel justified in our actions because they're only savages, or women, animals, it's the mentality of meat.
Indeed, eating animals is not simply a matter of personal ethics. It's the inevitable end result of a deeply entrenched, oppressive system. So eating animals is really a social justice issue. And if we fail to pick out the common threads that are woven through all these violent systems, we'll simply recreate atrocities in new forms. The real problem is, or the root of the problem, is the consciousness. It's the mentality that drives oppression and violence in the first place. What we really need to do is to work on a shifting consciousness. So what's the solution then? How can we help move beyond this mentality that we've been indoctrinated with and create a more compassionate and healthy world? Well, I want to address this question with a question for you. And that question is, why do you think we use defenses, these carnistic defenses in the first place? Why go through all the psychological acrobatics? The reason is we care. We care about animals. We care about justice and we care about the truth. And carnism depends on our not caring and the system is built on deception. So our caring is both the problem and the solution. Our caring is what makes us want to turn away from the truth, but our caring is also what gives us the courage to face the truth. It gives us the courage to bear witness. Bearing witness is choosing to be aware. And it is also helping raise awareness in others. This is something that people in the yoga community have been doing for a very, very long time. It's what you're doing here with this festival. And the good news is that there is an alternative to carnism. The vegan movement which is the counterpoint to carnism, is one of the fastest growing social justice movements in the world today. It is, I'm not saying it's the fastest growing, but it is a very, very rapidly growing movement. And there are simple things that we can all do to move beyond carnism and to help the world move beyond carnism. One is to become a vegan ally. A vegan ally is a person who is not fully vegan yet themselves, but who uses their influence, who is a supporter of veganism and of vegans, and who uses their influence to help transform carnism. This means to be as vegan as possible, right? So just ask yourself if you're not vegan yet, how vegan can you be? Each meal you sit down to, how vegan can you make that? How can you use your influence to raise awareness? Raising awareness of carnism is fundamental to helping transform the system and to being an ally. That means using your influence. You, in the yoga community, you are constantly influencing others, um, especially those of you who are teachers, who are mentors, who are, who are models. And really, awareness is so key because for better or worse, we are all participants in this system that is carnism. So our choice is not whether we participate, but how we participate. And with awareness, we can choose to be active witnesses rather than passive bystanders. With awareness, we can make choices that reflect our compassionate nature. And then we can more fully become as Gandhi said, the change that we wish to see. Thank you so much.